In analytics, normally we're interested in analyzing collections of data values. We might have a data set that gives us the selling prices of bulldozers that are sold at auction. We might have a data set that tells us the number of minutes that people have used on their cell phone plan in a particular month. Or we might have a data set of people's hair colors, and we want to know what the most frequently occurring hair color is. So we want to learn how to represent collections of data values as objects in R. And to do that, we're going to learn all about vectors. A vector is an object that stores a collection of data values, numbers, text, whatever you want to put in it. So let's learn how to create vectors and how we can work with them in R. So a vector is an object that consists of a collection of data values. And the way that we're going to create a vector is by using the C command, C for collection. So for example, let's imagine that I wanted to create a vector that contains three numbers, 6.4, 10.3, and 2.3. The way that I'm going to do this is to invoke the C function by typing out C parenthesis, entering in the values that I want treated as a collection, separated by commas, and then closing that pair of parentheses. So if I were to run this line as a command, I can see that that 6.4, the 10.3, the 2.3 is being treated as a collection of data values, and maybe I could get the average value of those three numbers by putting that inside the mean function. Now, vectors can also contain text. Maybe I have a collection of data values that consist of people's favorite animals, a cat, a dog, a rabbit, a black necklace scimitar babbler. And to create a text vector, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start out by typing out C parenthesis, and then I'm going to put in the entries that I want to have in that vector, separated by commas, but then also surrounded by a pair of quotes. Now, my favorite is to use double quotes, but single quotes are also acceptable. Maybe we create a vector of phone numbers, same sort of method. Start out by typing C parenthesis and then having each entry be separated by commas, but in quotes. Sometimes we want to create a text vector that we can treat as a bona fide categorical variable. A variable where there's a finite set of possible values like yes versus no, pass versus fail, hair colors, state of origin, etc. And there's going to be a special way that we create a vector that contains a categorical variable. We refer to this as a factor, and the way that we create that is to start out by creating the vector that contains the entries we want. Here's a vector of pass and fails. And then we put that inside the factor command so that R will treat this as a categorical variable. And if we print out the value of that vector to the screen, we see not only the entries, but we're also given a set of levels. Now it is possible to go back and forth between numeric vectors and factors or categorical variables. So for example, imagine we had a collection of numbers, you know, a bunch of ones, twos, eights, and fives, and we wanted to split this up into three categories for small, medium, and large. Well, an advanced command that you can use in R to do this is called the cut function, which is going to take a numeric vector and then a set of breakpoints where you want the categories to start and end. And then you could say what you want each category to be named after. And at the end of the day, once you set this up correctly, what you have is you've converted that set of numbers into a set of categories, a categorical variable, a factor, where we have the values, small, large, and medium, and then also the set of levels, the possible values that we might see in that vector, the level set here, small, medium, and large. It's also possible to actually treat numbers as a set of categories in themselves. Maybe we have some sort of data that talks about various codes that are being announced in a hospital or a store. Maybe we have a code 2, a code 5, and a code 9. And maybe we want to treat the 2, 5s, and 9s as uh, levels of a categorical variable. Easy for us to do, just like what we created with that categorical variable with pass-fail. We'll take that vector that we want to be treating as a collection, and then put that through the factor command to create a bona fide categorical variable. So we see the entries, and then we see the level set here, the list of possible values that categorical variable might have. Now, we can also do the conversion the other way around. We can actually take a categorical variable and convert it into numbers, but very often that doesn't make too much sense. So for example, if I had a factor that just had the elements cat and dog in it, I can run that through a function called as numeric, and R will do its best to convert the elements of that categorical variable into numbers. But if I do that in this case, I get a bunch of ones and twos out. And here it's just saying, OK, well, cat went first alphabetically. I'll just give that a one. Dog went second alphabetically. I'll give it a two. Not something that's all that meaningful for us. 
Now, a lot of times though, if we did have a set of levels that were bona fide numbers and we wanted to treat them as numbers in an analysis by getting their mean, their median, etc., we might start out with a factor, a categorical variable with entries two, five, and nine, and we wanna recover what the actual numbers were back. It turns out that's a little bit more complicated than you might expect. You first actually have to convert that into pure text with the as character command, and then run that through the as numeric command to actually get that treated correctly. If you um, were to do this the other way around, as numeric, just for the factor of the two fives and nines, you notice we're getting the ones, twos, and threes out. R is getting confused. So converting between you know, numbers and categorical variables, sometimes straightforward, sometimes you gotta work a little bit at it. Now, one thing to keep in mind if you wanna create a text vector is that every single entry needs to be surrounded by a pair of quotes. If you leave quotes off, R is going to look for a variable by that name and it'll try to insert the contents of that variable. So here's what I mean. Let's define a vector X to be a text vector because it's full of cheetahs. And now let's try to create another vector that starts out a really kind of funny joke here. So why shouldn't you play poker in the jungle? So each element is a word in that sentence. If I follow that up with X in quotes, what we'll find is that X is being treated as the word X. Why shouldn't you play poker in the jungle? X. Well, that's not a very funny joke. But if I left the quotes out of X and I just referred to X as the variable, R is gonna go look in the global environment for an object called X and insert that into the last elements of this vector. So why shouldn't you play poker in the jungle? Because it's full of cheetahs. Now, often in analytics, we need special types of vectors called sequences. Maybe we're interested in studying the probability that someone would make a purchase based on the price of the item. And we wanna try out prices like a dollar, a dollar fifty, two dollars, two dollars fifty, et cetera. There's a sequence of values that are regularly increasing by a given uh, increment. And there's a shortcut for how we can create such sequences in R. What we're going to do is use the SEQ the sequence command in order to create a regularly spaced sequence. And to do so, we need to specify three of four possible arguments from the starting value to the ending value by the increment by numbers. Does it go up by 0.5? Does it go up by increments of five? And the length, the total number of elements in a sequence. So for example, let's imagine that I wanted to generate the sequence 10, 10.25, 10.5, 10.75, and 11. Well, here's a few different ways that I could do this. So starting out with the SEQ command, I'm gonna say, well, I want this to start from 10. I want it to go all the way to 11. And because here I can see what the increment is, it's going up by 0.25. I could say by 0.25. We've got it there. Now, another way I could do this, I need three of those four arguments. If I were to copy and paste this, if instead of using the by argument, I could say length equals, and because I know there's one, two, three, four, five different elements in the sequence, I could say, hey, I need a sequence of length five, starting at 10, ending at 11, total of five elements in there. Or I could even do this a different way. I could say, well, let's start at 10, let's go up by 0.25, and let's have the sequence be length five, and we're able to generate the sequence that way as well. Now, there's a special sort of sequence, an integer sequence, where all the values are integers that just go up by one that there's a special shortcut for. So the way that we can make an integer sequence is using the colon shortcut. What we can do is we can say, okay, I want the sequence to start, let's say at 20. I want it to go up to 35. So I'm gonna put a colon after the 20, put where the sequence ends, and this will go and put out that integer sequence 20, 21, all the way up to 35. Likewise, this works if I want them to decrease. If I want to start out at 15 and go down to one, 15 colon one will go 15 to 14, et cetera, et cetera. Now, another nifty way to actually generate vectors is using the rep function. If you need a particular pattern generated a certain number of times. So for example, if I wanted to create a vector of 25 zeros, I don't want to just, you know, zero comma zero comma zero comma zero, keep that running total in my head. No one's going to want to do that. Instead, what I could do is I could use the rep command and then say, well, what do I want to have repeated? Just the number zero here. And then how many times do I want that repeated? A total of 25. Rep 0, 25 is going to give us 25 zeros. If, for example, I wanted to create the lyrics to a very popular Christmas song, fa la 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 la, la 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 la, well, how could I do this? 
Well, that first element of that vector is the word fa, and then la needs to be repeated a total of eight times. So I could just add to that vector and say rep la comma eight. If I just highlight the rep la comma eight, I can see the la 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 la. And then when I create that vector in total, we'll start out with the fa, fa la 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 la. And then finally, one last example. Let's imagine that I wanted to create a vector that contains a, a, b, b, c repeated a total of five times. Well, let's start out by creating that blank vector, kind of a C parentheses, and let's fill this in one by one. So what I want is I want a repeated two times, then I want b repeated three times, then I just want the letter C here. So if I were to create this vector, a, a, b, 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 c, I could actually use that as my argument for rep to repeat that sequence a total of five times. So I could actually preface this command by rep. Here's my first argument of rep now here, basically what sequence I want to have repeated. Add in a comma, times equals to five, and there we would have our result. So after we've created a vector, how do we do analytics on it? Well, one thing we might be interested in doing is referring to elements of the vector. What's the uh, number or the text string in the very first position of this vector? Or what about the 10th position, the 50th positions, etc.? So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to refer to elements of a vector. And I think a good way to think of this is to think of a vector kind of like a train. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine a train that's full of people that have taken their seats. So there's going to be a person in the first seat in the train. There's going to be a person in the second seat of the train. Maybe there's not going to be a person in seat number three, but there is a person in seats four, five, six, etc. So when we refer to positions inside of a vector, we'd like to know what elements are inside those positions. We can see that the person in the fourth seat, the element that is in position number four, is equal to the value 1.1. The element in the sixth position in this example, 8.2 here. So how do we extract out the elements in various positions inside of a vector? Well, the way that we're going to do this is to use a pair of square brackets. This is how we make positional references to elements that are inside of a vector. So let's get a vector that we can work with. Let's define the vector x to be the collection of values 2, 5, minus 3, and 10. If we want the second element of that vector, well, I can just look at it. I know the answer is 5 here. But if I want to produce that automatically in R, what we're going to do is we're going to type out the name of the vector and immediately put square brackets right after the name. And then we're going to give it a number for what position I'm referring to. If I want the second element, x bracket 2 is going to get me there. And I can put in more than one number, more than one value inside those square brackets. For example, if I wanted the fourth and then the first element of that vector, well, inside the square brackets, I could create a vector for comma 1. Show me what's in the fourth and the first positions. Now, we can use the left arrow notation to, on the fly, redefine the different elements of a vector. So, for example, if I wanted to make the second element of this vector equal to 8, what I can do is I can refer to that second element as an x bracket 2. Right now it's equal to 5. But I can use my left arrow notation, my definitional notation, to change this value to something else. So x bracket 2 left arrow 8 is now going to make the second element equal to 8. If I print out x's contents, I see that that change has taken place. And I can redefine multiple elements at the same time. If I want to make the first and fourth elements equal to 10 and 2 respectively, well, I can refer to the first and fourth elements by x square bracket and then putting in the vector 1 comma 4 here to refer to that first and fourth position. And then I can left arrow that to be the new values that I want them to assume. So I want them to be 10 and 2 respectively. This is a collection of data values, so we'll create the vector 10 comma 2 so that the first element becomes 10, the second element becomes 2, and if I print out the contents of x to the screen, I see that that change has taken place. Other times in analytics, we want to throw away elements. Maybe we have a bad data value. Maybe we were collecting the weights of various people in a classroom, and someone put in 25,000 pounds, obviously a nonsensical value. Sometimes we want to omit or exclude elements in various positions. So how can we do this? Well, let's redefine our vector x to be 2, 5, minus 3, and 10. And let's think about what if we wanted everything but, let's say, the third element. 
Well, to exclude certain positions in a vector, we're going to use the minus sign. If I type out x bracket minus 3, that's essentially shorthand for give me everything but the third element of x. We can see that would be 2, 5, and then 10. The minus 3 is getting skipped over. And in fact, I could update the definition of x to be everything but that third element as well. I could say, okay, let's redefine x, f le x left arrow, x bracket minus three. Remember the way that this is parsed, r is gonna always evaluate what's on the right-hand side of the left arrow first. So it's gonna look at the vector two, five, 10, and then it's gonna redefine, it's gonna shoot a new definition into x to be that vector here. So now x is now the numbers two, five, 10. And we could use that definition to create yet another vector. Maybe we wanted to define a new vector y that contains everything but the first and the third elements of x. Well, we can exclude multiple elements at the same time. And you can imagine how this is gonna turn out. If I say y left arrow to create a new object called y, x bracket and then minus the positions that I wanna exclude. Well, I have a collection of positions I wanna exclude the first and third positions here. X bracket minus C one comma three is gonna define Y to be everything but the first and third elements of X. So essentially just the number five. Now, when we get deep into the analytics, very often we're going to refer to very particular elements that we find interesting. Maybe we only want to look at those selling prices that are above $10,000 for our bulldozer selling price data set. Maybe we only want to look at the subset of people who listed cat, dog, or bird in their responses for what their favorite animal was. So the way that we can refer to positions inside of a vector that meet some condition, like at least 10 equal to bird, is by using the which command. So the which command is very useful for figuring out the positions of a vector that, some, that satisfy some condition of interest. So let's see how this works. Let's define the vector x to be this collection of data values here. And maybe I wanna know where inside the vector x do I see twos? Where are the positions of the elements that are equal to two? Well, just eyeballing it, I know that the third element is equal to two, but after that, I kind of lose track. The last one is, but I don't know how many values are inside here. So let's use the which function to figure this out. So if I wanna know the positions of a vector that satisfies some condition, I can say which and then parentheses, and then put in the condition that I find interesting. In this case, I wanna know which positions are equal to two. And the way that I ask, hey, is that the case? Are they equal to two or not? Is I'm gonna use the double equal sign. The single equal sign is actually equivalent to the left arrow. So a single equal sign defines an object to be some value. The double equal sign checks to see if one object is equal to another. So if we need to check to see is this equal to two or not, we'll be using the double equal sign. And so we find that the third and the 12th position of the vector X are equal to two. What are the positions of elements less than zero? Well, which, and then type in the condition that interests us. Which elements of X are less than zero? Typing that out, we find that the fourth, the fifth, and the 11th positions of X are less than two. Now, sometimes we wanna push that beyond just knowing where inside that vector do we find certain elements. We wanna know, give me those elements that are less than zero. Give me those elements that are at least equal to 10. And so we can accomplish that fairly easily by taking the output of which and putting that inside a square bracket. So if I wanna know what are the elements of X that are less than zero, well, I know what positions contain the elements of X that are less than zero. So I can just put my vector X in some square brackets and put inside those square brackets, those positions, four, five, and 11. I could type that out manually or I could copy and paste the result of that which command so that when R evaluates it, it evaluates the innermost stuff part first, the fourth, fifth, 11th element, X bracket four, five, 11, minus 10, minus four, minus two. And so I can start doing analytics on say a subset of the values in my vectors. What's the average of all the elements that are greater than zero? Well, let's construct this in pieces here. If I were to ask which X greater than zero, this lets me know the positions inside the vector X where I do find elements that are bigger than zero here. If I extract those out of X by putting that inside the square brackets right after X here, I get the actual elements that are bigger than zero. And then I can put that inside the mean function to get the average of all this. So 4.33, I've excluded the negative elements and I've taken the average of only the positive ones.
Now, we can combine conditions to make our conditions of interest a bit more sophisticated. Maybe what we'd like to know are, hey, where are the elements of x that are between 0 and 4? Let's work with this updated definition of the vector x. If I were to ask, hey, where are the positions of elements that are between 0 and 4? We're essentially asking for the ones where x is at least 0 and less than or equal to 4. Turns out there's no quick way to write between a set of values in R. We need to combine two conditions with an AND symbol. So between 0 and 4 means at least 0 and less than or equal to 4. And we're going to represent that AND with the ampersand symbol. So where do we find those positions? Well, only the first and the third position here. These are the only elements of x that are actually between 0 and 4, the 1 and the 2. All right, how about what are the positions of the elements that are equal to 2 or that are missing? Well, we can use some logical conditions to figure this out. We'll type out which, and then we'll specify the conditions that we find interesting. Equal to 2 would be x double equal to 2. Or missing, well, we need a symbol for or. That is the vertical pipe symbol. That's going to be the shift backslash, actually. And if we want to know which ones are missing, actually, we'll use the is.na function to figure that out. It turns out you can't double equal an NA value. The only way you can make reference to checking to see if an object exists or is missing is using that is.na command. And so we find that the third, the sixth, the eighth, and the twelfth elements are either equal to two or are missing. Now, one extremely useful shortcut when trying to find elements that you find interesting is the percentage in shortcut. Maybe you want to know, hey, where are all those elements that are equal to 1, 5, 10, or 12? So let's work with this vector x, and let's try to figure out where we find elements that are equal to 1, or 2, or 5, or 12. Well, that's going to be a lot of ors, but we can do this. So which x equals 1, or x equals 2, or x equals 5, or x equals 12. The double equal sign checks equality. Remember that single equal sign sets equality, just like the left arrow. So we need the double equal sign here to check to see, do we have an element equal to 1 or 2, etc. And we find that the first element is, yep. The second element, yep, that matches our condition. The fourth element, yep, that's one of these four numbers. But let's do this the better way. Let's use the percentage in shortcut. So if I were to just ask x percentage in and then give it the vector of values that I find interesting in this case, 1, 2, 5, or 12, what we notice is that we get a vector of trues and falses out. So yes, 1 is inside this vector. 5 is inside this vector. 8 is not inside this vector, so I get a false out. So when I run a logical condition like less than, double equals, percentage in, it actually is giving me trues or falses. And the which lets me know which of those are actually true, the objects that I find interesting here. So if I want to know the elements that are equal to 1 or 2 or 5 or 12, well, let's figure that out. I can start out by saying which x is percentage in this vector here. Which elements of x appear somewhere inside this list of values? Well, the first, the four, second, the fourth, the eighth uh, positions. And putting that inside square brackets, I would get to extract out those values themselves. And I get 1, 5, 2, 5. Turns out there's no 12s in my, in my vector. And I could use this to maybe extract out the even numbers as well. How could I do that? You know, that sequence command might be useful. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, et cetera, et cetera, going up in, um, in uh, increments of 2. Let's try this out. If I were to say which x percentage in, and then sequence from 2 to 100, let's say, just scanning these values, you know, they're all between you know, 2 and 100 here for the, for the even numbers. If I say by equal to 2, this would give me, if I just highlight that seq command, all the even numbers between 2 and 100. So which x percentage in that sequence lets me know that I do find an even number in the third, the fourth, and then the 10th positions. And if I wanted to extract those out, I could put that inside the square brackets. Perfect. Now, as an alternative to which, you can actually use the subset command. And this might make a little bit more sense to you. So if I wanted to get the elements that are less than 3, I could say, well, let's take a subset of the elements of x and then put in the condition that I find interesting, x less than 3. And this would let me know, here's all those elements that are less than 3. What about the non-missing elements? I could ask for a subset of x where they're not missing. 
Now, how would I write not missing in R? It turns out is.na lets you know if they are missing. To negate that, we can put an exclamation point beforehand. All right, so what are some last things that we need to know about vectors? Well, it's kind of cool that R can do vector arithmetic. Let's imagine that I had a vector of 8 and 3 and 4. If I ran something like 3 times x plus 4, what is R going to do? Well, it's going to apply that mathematical operation to each element in that vector. So it'll take the first element, 8, multiply by 3, add that to 4. That'll be the first element of the result. The last element of that result will take that 4, that last element, multiply by 3, add 4. So we can see that whatever arithmetic operations that we apply to a vector are going to be applied in turn to each element. Kind of a nice way to do the same thing to a collection of numbers. So I could do something like take the square root of x, and that would take the square root of each element. I could take e and raise it to x. That would take e and raise it to each element of x. So it's kind of cool. And we can actually add and have two vectors interact with each other. They need to be the same length. They need to have the same number of elements, or you get a warning message. So let's imagine I have the vector y here to be 6, 4, 2. Well, I could add these two vectors together. That would add the first elements, the second elements, the third elements to get my result. I could multiply these two together as well. And that would do element-wise multiplication, the 8 times the 6, 48, the 4 times the 2, the 8. So when we do a vector arithmetic, the operations that we're applying to that vector get applied to each element in turn. So we can do crazy things like take x, raise it to the y power, and subtract off the ratio between y and x. It essentially would look at the first elements, calculate what this quantity is for that first element, do the same thing for the second, do the same thing for the third, etc. So when we're doing analytics on vectors, what are some typical things that we like looking at? Well, let me load in the reg class library and the account data set. This lets us know the behaviors of some customers to a bank. If I were to click the arrow, it lets me know what variables that I have. And let's look at this tenure column the length of time that a customer has been with this bank. What are some things that we can do? Well, we like to visualize our data by making maybe histograms or box plots with numerical data. So if I were to say hist account dollar sign tenure, that's going to extract out the tenure column, and I'd get a histogram of the data values. And I have some control over what that histogram looks like. If I were to go and say breaks equals to 50, that's going to try to make a histogram with about 50 or so bars. And I can even get finer control over where those breaks are by using the seek command. If I go and say breaks equals seek, that's going to let me actually specify where I want each bar to start and end. So maybe I wanted to start it from zero. I wanted to go all the way up to 100. That's more than the, uh, the largest value in my data. But increments of two, this would make it so that the start and end locations are zero, two, four, et cetera. Box plots, well, we learned about that in STAT 201. We can make a box plot in R just by invoking the box plot command. And so we can see there's a lot of outliers here. And we know that in analytics, we have a choice over actually what we end up doing analytics on. We could, instead of analyzing the actual values in the tenure column, since it is a pretty skewed distribution here, a lot of outliers, we could instead analyze the logarithms. We could ask, instead of making the histogram of the original values, let's make a histogram of the log base tens. We get a nice more symmetric distribution. And a lot of stuff we'll learn about the analytics toolbox excels when our distributions look a little bit more symmetric instead of skewed. What other things would we do? Well, we might get a summary of the values that we have in our vector. So we could get the minimum value, the maximum value, the first and third quantiles, the mean, the median. This is the five number summary and then also the uh, some additional information here. We can get the mean directly by invoking the mean command. We can get the median. You kind of get the idea. We have commands for all these typical summary measures and we just have to figure out what that command is and then shoot at the vector that we want to be summarizing. So that's what we would look at with numerical variables. For categorical variables we typically want frequency tables. How often do we see each category? So if I load up the CUS loyalty data set, there's a nice column that lets me know the income levels of all of the customers of this business, 500 customers in total. So what would we do? We could look at a summary of that column. So extracting out the income column of here, we'd get the total number of individuals that fell into each one of these income categories. 
we can convert these into percentages to get the uh, relative frequency uh, table by doing table instead of summary and then doing, getting the income column and dividing it by the number of elements that we have in that vector here, the number of rows we essentially have in our data frame. So taking that 47, dividing it by 500, taking the 57, dividing it by 500 to get this. And we can even visualize this with a bar plot. We could say bar plot table and then extract out the values to make a vector of the incomes here. And we could see how often we see each of those categories. Very often you'll have to make that window a little bit bigger in order to see the labels of each of those different categories. But there's your crash course introduction to how R refers to collection of data values, which is typically what we're gonna be analyzing in analytics.